people are doing the same thing with the new covenant that Israel did with the old covenant. You're going to trust God for every blessing he said he's going to give. But when he promises to punish sin and rebellion, you say, no, not me. Once saved, always saved. Welcome back. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome to Are You Sure? The podcast, where our goal is to inspire Bible believers to become Bible students. If you've been joining us, you know I am D the Troublemaker here with my cousin L. Decides the Wise Guy. And we've been, you know, at it again, um, you know, really diving back into the scriptures with the last episode. And if you missed it, you need to go back and check it out because we are giving some really great insight on how to study the Bible for yourself. Um, We let the Bible interpret the Bible and you let the Holy Spirit, you know, guide you through it. And, and, you know, you'll get everything you need. Um, Gone are the days that, you know, you should rely on somebody else to be um, telling you what the Bible says. I, I think at this point, at this point in time, everyone should be or should be willing to dive into the scriptures and try to gain a better understanding on what God is is saying through the scriptures. Um, And you do that by letting the Bible interpret the Bible and and studying and and doing diligent research, um, cross-referencing scriptures and things like that. And we had a... uh, a great episode um, using Daniel as an example on how to do that. I always thought that was fascinating. Um, you know, if you missed it, it's to the point where, you know, the scriptures are saying, oh, you want to know about this king? Hello, did you look in kings? <laughs> um, you know, sometimes it's that simple. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's a little bit um, more involved. Um, if you are able to get some of the resources and tools like a concordance, um, I think sometimes they, they're digital now. I think you might be able to get them. Um, and online, um, those are a, a, a big tool uh, that helps helps you to guide or, or look for certain things through the scriptures and help you uh, navigate um, a little bit more swiftly. Um, so with that said, let's jump right in today. All right. <clears throat> so as you said, um, we were looking at Daniel as our, our study uh, source. And Daniel is just set up for Bible study. It really is set up to be like a textbook. And so we looked at the first two verses of Daniel and, you know, it says in the third year, Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon under Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah into his hand with a part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar into the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. And so just looking at those two verses, even before we get to discussing Daniel, we traced it back. And we saw that, yeah, Jehoiakim did evil in the sight of the Lord. Because one of the questions we were asking is, why did the Lord himself deliver his people into the hand of the heathen? And as we trace that back, you know, as you said, following the simple uh, steps, we looked in the book of Kings for King Jehoiakim. When we went to Kings, it said to look in Chronicles. And as we, we went through these steps, it led us back to Manasseh. And said that, you know, Manasseh was the cause of what happened with Daniel being taken captive. And as we looked at Manasseh, it led us back to work his father. And then we find out that the prophecy was actually first spoken to his father, Hezekiah. And that Hezekiah did not do even in the sight of the Lord, but Hezekiah has some traits of character that he passed on to his son that would not have happened had he just listened to the Lord. And I don't want to go through all that episode, but as you go through the book of Daniel, you'll find out that that's really not the end of the story. It seems like we really reached the end of the story. This is what I love about the Bible. It's like, okay, you think you got it now, but there may be a little bit more to the story. Now let's just have a quick word of prayer because I'm going to open the scriptures and, and get right in. So let's just have a quick word of prayer. Heavenly father, Lord, as we come together to study your word once again, we want to ask for your Holy Spirit to be our guide, to lead us into all truth. And Father, not just to know the truth intellectually, 
but to receive the power of the Holy Spirit to also have an experience in the truth, that we may learn practical lessons from these stories of the past, that we may know how to conduct ourselves here in the present, that we may be prepared for the future events that you have prophesied to come. And so we thank you, dear Lord, for the promise of your Holy Spirit. We pray for ourselves as well as the listening audience that you will speak to us, Lord, in clear tones and that you will take the complex things of the Bible and make them simple. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. I wanted to say really quick before we dive in, um, when you look at the Bible, um, the Bible is a collection of historical events that's documented from various peoples that's, that's inspired by God. And when you look at it, like you said, we went through, kind of look at it like this. And then you have to compare it to, you know, we look at the fruit of what's going on. And I think I mentioned this last uh, episode. You got to go back and trace back to the root. Think about something in your family. Think about an individual in present day. And you're just wondering, why do they act like that? Or why do they have this illness? Well, it's kind of the same principle. Well, you go back and see what was going on with their parents. <laughs> And then if you can't get it, yeah. then you go back and see what was going on with their grandparents. And then maybe it's an aunt or uncle that has some information. Or maybe it's a cousin or something that was, you know, back then that might have the information. So it's kind of like going, kind of like just following back to the roots of things. And, and that that's the kind of a good way to think about it. Exactly. And, you know, because, you know, we try to keep these episodes under like three, four hours. <laughs> I couldn't give all the details and all of the applications from that last study. But when I actually give that study to like a, a audience and I'm just focusing in on that study, those are some of the things I say. This is what you, you're, you're supposed to draw from and take away from these first two verses, that the things that are happening presently can be have their um, origin and things that happened in the past. And even some of the things we may struggle with, you know what I'm saying? Uh, be it addictions or immoralities, things like that. A lot of times it's because, you know, either your direct parents or your grandparents may have had that problem. And it's also, you know, they call it like generational curses or, or whatever. But, you know, your parents and your grandparents die. Um, but the, the fallen angels who were influencing them, they don't e and they know and they understand where your ancestors fell. And so they understand the law of heredity and, and all these scientific things. And they're going to try you in the same way that worked on your ancestors. And so it's good for us as parents. Once we understand these type of things to prepare our children for by I don't necessarily mean telling them all the <laughs> the stuff you did, but at least, you know, informing them of your weaknesses and where they need to watch for these weaknesses in themselves, you know? And, and I'm not talking about when they're five, you know, what I'm, I'm talking about right. when they're at age of reason that you, you, you yourself look for these things and then you try to educate them on how, you know, these things may try to manifest in their life and experience. Yeah. So... Yeah, because I know yeah, that's something that I do bring up when when we yeah. study this in a smaller group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, good. All right. So in this the second part, we still won't really be focused on those first two verses, but we're going to trace it back even further. We in down. Now, nobody said nothing about Daniel yet. We still on the first two verses. <laughs> yeah, yeah, basically. But but this study actually um, sparked from two different things. Okay. One, I was studying the book of Daniel with this small group. And in that small group, there were some parents. And while we were going through chapter one, talking about them taking captive, you know, one of them made a very simple observation and kind of a simple question that made me look at the information differently. And this is why it's good to study together sometimes, because even the it wasn't anything deep, but the, the observation based on, you know, their role as parents made me look at the information differently. Because when I came into the book of Daniel, I'm just coming into the book of Daniel with Daniel as the hero. Mm -hmm. But as we were studying, they, um, their observation was, I wonder what their parents felt like having their children taken away from them that way. 
Mm. And I had never given thought that, you know, yeah, they had parents. And it says that these were children, so they weren't very old. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so their parents had to watch their children be taken away from them. And we have no record, you know, that they saw them again or, or whatever. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. Regardless to what, their their parents were affected by what we see happening in Daniel chapter one. And I had never thought about that. Mm. And so that made me start to look at the information differently. But as you read through the book of Daniel, you'll come to Daniel chapter nine. And then Daniel chapter nine adds another layer to what we see going on in Daniel chapter one. Mm. So turn to Daniel chapter nine real quick. And so, like we said, like you said in the introduction, that sometimes the information is right there on the surface. And God says, you know, the other acts of so on and so forth are not written in the book of Chronicles. Mm -hmm. And it's like right there. But sometimes you have to pay attention to just the information as it's being given. Okay. So it's not until you get to Daniel chapter 9 that within the book of Daniel, Daniel gives you some more information. So let's go to Daniel chapter 9. We're going to read verses 1, 1 through 3, and then 11 and 13. And this says, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldees, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the number of years, whereof the word of the Lord came to who? Jeremiah the prophet. Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. So after this verse, he starts praying. And so I'm going to read two verses from this prayer, verses 11 and 13. And he says, Ye all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore, the curse is poured upon us and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. As it is written, verse 13, as it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil has come upon us. Yet may we not our prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn from our iniquities and understand thy truth. Mm. Now, I want you to understand what Daniel just said. Daniel just said, we are in this captivity. And basically what you see happening in Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, he doesn't mention Jehoiakim. He doesn't mention Manasseh. He doesn't mention Hezekiah. He says it is written in the law of Moses. Mm -hmm. And he actually came to this conclusion. And somehow it was sparked by studying the book of Jeremiah, because that's how he starts the, the chapter. Mm -hmm. He says, I understood by the number of years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, the prophet. So he's looking at and studying Jeremiah, the prophet. But when he prays, he prays about what is written in the law of Moses. And so based on this, it made me compare Jeremiah's book with the writings of Moses. And if you remember this um, series that we did, Conflict and Courage, in part two, we talked about the Hebrew Israelites. Mm -hmm. And the Hebrew Israelites talk about the curse that's yeah. in Moses and how that applies to slavery. Mm -hmm. This is actually how I discovered that. Because Daniel says in Daniel chapter 9 that the curse that Moses wrote was happening to him in his day. And that's actually how that information, I came across that information. I wasn't looking for that information to refute Hebrew Israelites. Had nothing to do with it. It was just naturally following where the Bible leads. And so in this study, we're going to be looking at the books of Jeremiah in comparison to the writings of Moses. And you're going to find out what's happening in Daniel chapter one was prophesied by Moses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was prophesied by Moses. Yeah, that's what he just said. He says the oath that is written in the law of Moses, as it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil is come upon us. And so, yeah, we traced it back to Hezekiah. But Daniel says, um, if you want to be a diligent student, you can actually trace this all the way back to Moses. And somehow in studying the book of Jeremiah, it led him to this prayer where he connected it to Moses. Mm. And 
like I said, if you if you've watched, of course we were together, but the audience, if they watched that series, Conflict and Courage, and part two where we talked about the Hebrew Israelites, you see how Jeremiah's writings are an echo of what Moses wrote in his book. Wow. And so if you're studying the book of Jeremiah, naturally, as you start looking at the language, it's going to remind you of the writings of Moses if you read those also. And that's actually from Daniel 9 is how I made that connection because okay. that's what Daniel did. All right. So I'm assuming so, here am I. <laughs> we are. We are. We just going to lay a little bit of um, foundation. And some of this, I'm going to just go through real quick. Now, in our last study, I wanted to add that the reason why these are important, and we may get into this later, and if you, you some of you may already know, um, you know, Daniel, Jeremiah, these are considered major prophets. So what yes. they say holds a lot of weight. It's not like it's just the ordinary Joe saying this is going to happen, but these are considered major prophets in the Bible. Yeah. And, you know, there's something else that I, I should bring up since you said that. Now, Daniel just said, we just read where Daniel said, what happened to us, this captivity that happened to us that we see in Daniel chapter one was prophesied by Moses. Mm -hmm. But then he also looks at the um, book of Jeremiah, where Jeremiah tells him how long the captivity is going to be. You will find in the Bible that this is a pattern which God uses. There's a verse in the Bible that says, surely God will do nothing unless he reveal it to his servants, the prophets. <clears throat> So if there's going to be a prophecy that happens, God has a prophet to prophesy that thing. When it comes time for the fulfillment, God raises up another prophet to let people know that it's happening. Mm. So you'll find in the book of Daniel a prophecy about Christ coming. Daniel was a prophet who prophesied that. When Christ came, John the Baptist was raised. And you see this over and over again. Whenever God does something, he raises up a prophet. If he has a, a time prophecy, he has a prophet at the beginning of that prophecy, and he has a prophet at the end of that prophecy. It's oh. always the same. But, and so Daniel just made that connection in Daniel chapter 9. I was studying Jeremiah, who prophesied, you know, how long we we're going to be in Babylon. But it led me back to the writings of Moses, who first prophesied. Mm -hmm. So it's just... That's just another pattern to understand. God always, he doesn't do things secretly. It's not that something's going to happen and it should take you by surprise. It only takes you by surprise if you ignore the warnings that God gives. But let's look back at 2 Chronicles 32 real quick. 2 Chronicles 32 and verse 32. And this is talking about Hezekiah. And it says, now the rest of the acts of Hezekiah and his goodness, behold, they are written, written in the vision of Isaiah, the prophet, the son of Amos, and in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. And so, again, we read this verse last time, but we didn't go back to Isaiah to look at that history. Mm -hmm. All right. But here it tells you plainly that if you want to know some more about Hezekiah, you can actually find some more about Hezekiah in the book of Isaiah, the prophet. Mm -hmm. And so. When you go back to Isaiah, the prophet, if you start at the very beginning, so let's just go to Isaiah chapter one and verse one. And it says the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. So, Many times when you go to the prophets, the very first verse will tell you which time period they prophesied by the kings that were reigning. Mm. And then when you go to kings and you see what was happening, it can help you to understand why the prophet was prophesying what they prophesied based on what the king was doing during this time of his rule. All right. So. We're not going to go through Hezekiah's history because it's not really that important. But let's go back to Daniel chapter one, Daniel chapter one. 
As a matter of fact, let's read a couple of verses from Isaiah first. Let's go to Isaiah 39. Isaiah 39. And we'll set up for Daniel chapter 1. We read this in the last episode. Well, we actually, actually, we did read it from Isaiah. We read it from uh, Kings. Mm-hmm. But now we're going to see the same information in Isaiah. Then we're going to go to Daniel chapter 1. So Isaiah 39, starting at verse 5. Then said Isaiah to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days come that all that is in thine house and that which thy fathers have laid up in store until this day shall be carried to Babylon, Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. Verse 7, And thy sons that thou sh- that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, shall they take away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Mm-hmm. So this is the same prophecy that you saw in Kings, but you see it's also in Isaiah. Mm-hmm. So with that in mind, let's go to Daniel chapter 1, and we're going to read the first four verses. Daniel chapter 1, the first four verses. And it reads, in the third year, the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, where the part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels, vessels into the treasure house of his God. And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes children in whom was no blemish but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning and knowledge and understanding science and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace in whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldees. So you see a direct fulfillment of what we just read in Isaiah Mm -hmm. that your children that issue before thee shall be eunuchs in the kingdom on the palace of the king of Babylon. And this is what's happening to Daniel. So Daniel was among these children that were taken. Now, just just as kind of a common sense question. Based on what we just read, how old about do you think these children were? Uh, I would say maybe, maybe teens, just just old enough not to to screw their life up but still old enough to be able to understand science and things like that. Thank you. Yeah. They already had to understand science. That verse is key. Mm-hmm. They were had to be cunning in knowledge. They had to be skillful in wisdom and have ability to stand in a king's palace. Now, it, it's not very many five or six year olds who got the patience to stand <laughs> and, 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 and be dignified in the king's palace. Right. So we're talking about teenagers. Mm-hmm. And so again, when I was doing that study with those parents, their children were about that age. Okay. And so they, when they read this, immediately they thought about their children. And like I said, I had never thought about that. So you have to understand that this didn't just happen by surprise. Jeremiah was prophesying that this was going to happen. All right. So let's go to... You know what's interesting though? For some reason, this this flashes me back to when Christ was separated from his family and they was looking for him. And he was young and talking to everybody and they wondering why this kid knows so much. And just the fact that he said a child with no blemish just makes me think about um him in that fashion. It's like he's got all his wisdom and understanding. <laughs> That's a good observation, but can't really go down that path. <laughs> <laughs> all, all in that description is for a reason because mm. it is telling you kind of the caliber of the children that were chosen mm. so so mm. yeah so we see from Daniel chapter 1 that Jehoiakim was in power mm-hmm. so based on what we learned earlier like what we saw that Isaiah um, it was four kings that were named that were ruling during his ministry so where would we go to find out who was the prophet prophesying during the reign of Jehoiakim? So we we'll go back to let's think about where, we, where, where, where do we find that information in Isaiah about who was reigning during the time in of the, the first. Where do we, thank you. So where might we look 
if we wanted to find out if there was a prophet prophesying during uh, Jehoiakim's reign? Uh, was that first verse of Jeremiah? Yeah, if you didn't know, you just go to the first verse of the prophet's book and right. see. So again, once you go to Isaiah, you find out another study tool. Mm -hmm. If you want to know where to find information in the prophets about the kings, go to the first chapter of the prophet's book and just maybe not all cases, but just maybe they'll give you a list of kings who were reigning at that time. So let's go to Jeremiah chapter one and see if that's the case. Jeremiah chapter one, starting at verse one, the words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, the priests that were in Anathoth and the land of Benjamin to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, and in the 13th year, in the 13th year of his reign, it also came in the days of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the end of the 11th year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the carrying away of Jerusalem captive in the fifth month. So now we see that Jeremiah was prophesying during the reign of Josiah, during the reign of Jehoiakim, and during the reign of Zedekiah, until the last siege upon Jerusalem, which it was destroyed by Babylon. And it actually gives you some information here too. In verse two, it said, talking about Jeremiah, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, and what? The 13th year of his reign. Now you think the Bible just gives details like that for, for any reason? It's giving you a way to track time mm -hmm. for the numbers. Of, and, 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 and most people, it, it may not matter. But when you study the way I do, all of these little details matter. Mm -hmm. And because of that question from the parents, I begin studying to focus on the parents and not Daniel. And I found something that was pretty, you know, pretty amazing to me. Okay. All right. So it mentions Josiah. It mentions Josiah. So where would we go to find some more information about King Josiah? We did this in part. Kings or Chronicles. <laughs> Thank you. So let's go to Second Kings twenty two. Second Kings twenty two. All right. It says Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned thirty and one years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Jediah, the daughter of Adiah of Bos Boscoff. All right. How old was Josiah at the end of his reign? Uh, 30, so at 39, 40 maybe? 39. Okay. <laughs> 39. 8 plus 31. Right. Good. Just want to make sure you're paying attention. <laughs> Trying to catch me slip. No. I see. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Now, in Jeremiah chapter one, it said that the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah in the 13th year of Josiah. Mm -hmm. All right. So, how old was Josiah when the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah? What, 26? Doing your math wrong. It was in the 13th year, Josiah. How old was Josiah when he began to reign? Oh, in the 13th year. Oh, okay, okay, okay. 21. 21. Thank yeah. you. Okay. So, see, and this is how you can use the Bible as a, a, a homeschool, you know, a book. This is math. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. We're using it as a word problem. All right, so how many years of Josiah's reign did Jeremiah prophesy? So he was 21 when he first started, right? Yeah. Yeah. Thir and, wait, in the 13th year or for 13 years? In the 13th year is when he started. So he was 20. Jeremiah, you're right. Josiah was 21. Okay. Let me give you the equation. He was 21 when he started. All right. And he lived to be 39. He was 20. I was just looking at that. Did you see he actually died? So that's 18 years. Exactly. Yeah, he did die. Okay. 
that's another interesting story too. We can't we can't go <laughs> into it. that's a that's a very interesting story. How Josiah died. Okay, but yeah. So Jeremiah was prophesying eighteen years. I did all that math and the answers in in verse three. <laughs> 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 Look, see, I take clues, y'all. I takes clues, man. <laughs> exactly. So, who became king after Josiah? We just read it in Jeremiah 1 3. Your whole head kid. So, let's go to 2 Chronicles 36. 2 Chronicles 36. And remember, Jeremiah prophesied for 18 years of Josiah's reign. On death. All right. And we're going someplace. Sometimes it looks like when you're doing stuff like this, that it's not connected. It is connected. Just just bear with me. All right. So in Second Chronicles 36, verse 5, it says, Jehoiakim was 20 and 5 years old when he began in the reign. And he reigned how long? 11 years. Jerusalem. 11 years. All right. So we just established that... Jeremiah prophesied for 18 years of Josiah's reign. Mm -hmm. And we know that he prophesied the entire time of Jehoiakim's reign. Mm -hmm. So how many years so far did Jeremiah prophesy? He reigned 11. So that was, what's that, 18 plus 11? Exactly. 29 years. 29 years. Mm -hmm. Now, I want you to think about this. Again, I'm showing you what that one question or that one comment from the parents caused me to do. This was all based on their observation. I would never probably have done this had they not made that observation. Okay. So that means that by the time we see the events in Daniel chapter one, Jeremiah had been prophesying for 29 years. Mm -hmm. Now, how old did we say that Daniel and his friends was probably around when they came there? Let's say 13, 14, in the teens. In their teens. 17, 18. Yeah. You know what that means? That means before they were born, Jeremiah was all, already prophesying that Babylon was going to come and take Israel captive. Okay. That also means that their parents would have been hearing the prophecies of Jeremiah while Daniel was still in the womb. So they knew that more believers than they would have probably wanted to prepare their children. Thank you. See, that's what I wanted you to come to, brother. Yeah. That's exactly the conclusion. The actual name of this study, when I do it as a part of the series, mm -hmm. is called The Rise of Babylon and Parental Responsibility. E. Like I said, I never thought about this until those parents were in the study and they made me think about what the parents must have been going through. Mm -hmm. Then when I followed the numbers in the Bible, I realized that those parents, one, they had to be godly parents, just like Christ's parents. That's when you made that connection. I'm like, yeah, mm -hmm. they also had godly parents. It didn't just happen that they went to Babylon and rose to the top that way. It's certain principles that they followed. And so because of that, it made me do this math to realize that, you know, before Daniel was born, they would have been listening to Jeremiah prophesying about a decade, even before, you know, the wife became pregnant with Daniel. Mm -hmm. And so the whole time Daniel is being raised, Jeremiah is prophesying about what's going to happen. Okay. And so if they were godly parents, they would be, one, one sec, they would be preparing their children. But go ahead, I'll let you no, I was just saying, if, if if Jeremiah is prophesying to the king and everybody, why at that point would he say, let's try to get ourselves together? Or if, if he's telling this for a reason, like what, what can we do to avoid <laughs> this happening? He told them how to avoid making it happen. But they just did. They kept rebelling. Yeah. All Jehoiakim served Nebuchadnezzar for three years. He could, Nebuchadnezzar wasn't about just conquering the city. Yeah. If they had to just, you know, kept up their end of the treaty, they would have been fine. 
up until the last day before um, Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem, Jeremiah said, if you surrender, it will be well. The city won't be destroyed and you will not be killed. To Zedekiah, up to the last day, he told him that. Yeah. But, you know, he had his advisors and this, that, and the other, pride, all this stuff, and they would not listen to the yeah. prophet. They actually cast the prophet into a pit. Try to set him up. As if, if you set the prophet up, the prophet's not going to come to pass. Right. Which is what people are doing with the Bible today. If we ignore the Bible, then what the Bible says doesn't matter. Well, we'll see. Daniel's book opens with the fact that no matter what you do, if what you got planned, when the prophecy comes to fulfillment, it's going to come. Now, you know what makes this study so relevant? Turn to the book of Revelation real quick. And it's already happening, but let's look at chapter 14 real quick. Revelation 14, 8. You got that? Yep. Read it real quick. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. All right. Jump over to 17 real quick. Uh, verse 17 of chapter. Chapter 17. Chapter 17. Read verse 5. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. See, what makes this study so relevant is that the end time power that's going to come to, that's going to rise to power, God calls Babylon. So there's a second Babylon prophesied in the last days to come to power. It's not talking about this literal Babylon that we're reading about in Daniel. But he tells us that in the last days, there's a power that the, biblically is called Babylon. And when it rises to power, the same type of things are going to happen. That your children will be put in jeopardy. Now tell me you don't see that happening already. Wow. Tell me you don't see that happening already. Where this system is trying to re-educate your children to accept that which God calls sin. The rise of Babylon and parental responsibility. You've been told that this power is going to rise. You were told by Christ himself that it'll be like the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. Made the connection. And they're already after your children. This is not future. We're already in the midst of the fulfillment of these prophecies. And, and, and in this case, God shows you that there's some cases that your children might actually be taken away from you. Are they ready, even as teenagers, to stand on their own if they're taken into the court or the environment of those who believe in paganism, witchcraft, and all this other stuff? And then when you, this is what's forward, going on in Daniel chapter one. When you say my forward is, you know, when you look, start actually looking at Daniel, you know, are they willing to stand fast, or will they forsake all of their teachings and foundation? Exactly. Yeah. So who who does that depend on though? Depends on the parents. Thank you. See, I never got that element from Daniel before. I just looked at Daniel as the hero. I never thought about his parents and what they must have been like. And see, when you, you start to do this, you see that this matters. We think about Jesus, but God actually chose it wasn't just random he chose mary he chose joseph and even showed us his character in the midst of how he chose him that joseph was a just man and put her away privily mm. so he, he's showing the type of character and parents that he gave him that parents influence is important as a matter of fact which means well, let's look at a couple of things this um, it's deep. I know it is. They said it takes us a little while to get there doing that math, but I want to show you really how I came. It's supposed to be how to decode the Bible, right? So I could tell you that Jeremiah was prophesying that whole time, but I'm actually taking you through the steps of how I did, how I know that for sure. Mm -hmm. I could have just told you, 
But a good teacher doesn't want to just tell you. He wants to empower you to be able to do what he does. And you see that you have to take a little bit of time. Yeah. Let's just look at some of the things they would have been hearing. We go to Jeremiah. 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 These are some of the prophecies that the parents would have been hearing while Jeremiah was prophesying. So while he was prophesying against the wickedness in the city and that Babylon was going to come, he's also going to be talking to the faithful to give the faithful hope. Jeremiah 15 and verse 11. The Lord said, Verily it shall be well with thy remnant. Verily I will cause the enemy to entreat thee well in the time of evil and in the time of affliction. And you see that promise? The remnant. He's talking about the ones who actually, the little the few little people who still honor me and obey me. When this happens, I don't want you to be afraid. I will cause the enemy to entreat thee well in the time of evil. So now they're raising their kids to be faithful to God so they can claim that promise. I will make the enemy treat you well in the time of evil. And because your, your children are so goodly, because your children are so polite, because they are so respectable, the king is going to find or, or count it an honor to have them in his very court. So they'll receive the best of everything. Mm. This is what happened in Jeremiah chapter 1. This is what's happening in Jeremiah chapter 1. This is how God fulfilled his word. I love this. You know what I'm saying? You see the promises a lot of time in the Bible, but then you don't see how they're fulfilled. But in this case, we can. Jeremiah 24. Jeremiah 24. Starting at verse four, again, the word of the Lord came unto me, Jeremiah saying, thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, like these good figs, so will I acknowledge them that are carried away captive to Judah of Judah, when, whom I have sent out of this place into the land of the Chaldeans for their good. For I will set mine eyes upon them for good, and I will bring them again to this land, and I will build them and pull and not pull them down. I will plant them and not pluck them up. And so just to give you a backdrop, Jeremiah was shown a basket of bad figs and a basket of good figs. And basically the bad figs represented those who were evil and they gonna rock. <laughs> he said, but like this basket of good figs, I'm going to make sure those who are carried away captive of Babylon that they're treated good there. Turn to Jeremiah 29. We're going to start at verse four again. It says, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, unto all that are carried away captive, whom I have caused to be carried away to Jerusalem unto Babylon. Build ye houses and dwell in them, and plant gardens and eat the fruit of them. Take ye wives and beget sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons, and give your daughters to husband, that they may bear sons and daughters, that, they, that ye may be increased there and not diminished. Verse 7 is actually powerful. It says, and seek the peace of the city, whither I have caused you to be carried away captives and pray unto the Lord for it, for in the peace thereof shall be, ye have peace. Did you see that? Mm. They're taken captive by Babylon, right? Make sure you pray for their peace because that's mm -hmm. where you're going to be at. And as they have peace, you'll have peace too. Mm. Interesting. Always remember that it was your sins that caused you to be taken captive. So don't hate your captors. You can be a good influence while you're among them. If you will turn back to God. And I'll even give you peace. If, if you think you're a captive there, do you think because somebody comes and conquers Babylon that they're going to treat you well? The best thing for you is to pay, pray for the peace of that city. Because while they have peace, you'll have peace too. Um, is it a potential that these, some of these kids were not born before they were captive or, or cause he, he's still. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, let's go down to verse 10. No, let's okay. go down to verse 10. For thus saith the Lord that after how long? 70 years. 70 years be accomplished at Babylon. I will visit you and perform my good word toward you and causing you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. Now, that's a very famous verse right there. Verse 11. I hear it all the time. Very few people know that was in the context of them being taken captive. Mm. 
that God said this while they would be taken, taken captive. Now you see verse 10, right? Mm -hmm. It says, for thus saith the Lord that after how long? 70 years. Really quick. Turn back to Daniel chapter nine. Really quick. Turn back to Daniel chapter nine. Read verse two again. We read this. Now read verse two. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the numbers of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years and the desolations of Jerusalem. This is the prophecy he was reading that we just read right now. Jeremiah, that verse 10 that we just read, after 70 years, I will come and visit you. So Daniel said he understood by reading Jeremiah that the 70 years was over. Okay. He was reading this prophecy that we're reading right now. Okay. So we found the prophecy basically. Okay. You won't find in the book of Jeremiah the education that was necessary for Daniel to be what he had to be, mm -hmm. him and his friends. Mm -hmm. But what you will find in Jeremiah is that the reason this captivity is happening is because they ignore the instruction of the education that they were supposed to give their children. Turn mm -hmm. to Jeremiah 11. Wait, say that one more time. Jeremiah did not give the specific instructions to parents for how to prepare their children for this. Okay. But he did prophesy that it was the lack of the preparation that and instruction that God had given that was causing this captivity. Okay. So we're going to go look at where he, he was prophesying this. Jeremiah 11, starting at verse 1. It said, The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying hear ye the words of this what's that next word covenant covenant and speak unto the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and say unto and say thou unto them thus saith the Lord God of Israel cursed be the man that obeyeth not the words of this what covenant which I commanded your fathers in the day that I brought them forth out of the land of what Egypt. You tell my Moses now. Thank you. <laughs> you see that word covenant. It's like, okay, where did he make a covenant? He, he made that covenant with Moses when they brought them out through Moses. All right. From the iron furnace saying, obey my voice and do them according to all which I command you. So shall ye be my people and I will be your God that I may perform the oath which I have sworn unto your fathers to give them a land flowing with milk and honey as it is this day. Then answered I and said, So be it, O Lord. Then the Lord, then the Lord said unto me, Proclaim all these words in the cities of Ju Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, saying, Hear ye the words of this what? Covenant. And do them. Thank you. For I earnestly protested unto your fathers in the day that I brought them up out of the land of Egypt, even unto this day, rising early and protesting, saying, Obey my voice. Yet they obeyed not, nor inclined their ear, but walked everyone in the imagination of their evil hearts. Therefore will I bring upon them all the words of what? Covenant, which I commanded them to do, but they did them not. not. But so you see, go ahead, go ahead. But this is, this is just burning to me. This is what I see right now coming from this. That whole once saved, always saved philosophy gets blown out of the water because in this case, we're talking about going back to Moses time and we're talking about the covenant. We're talking about a contract we got, which means two parties have to uphold their end of the bargain. So in this sense, God is saying, listen, y'all broke y'all covenant. It ain't about works. It ain't about this, that, and other. It's about, I've said, I'm going to do this. And you say, you're going to do this. When you don't do this, this is what happens. The covenant is broken. And written within the covenant is what's going to happen. What's going to happen? If you break. <laughs> yeah. If you break the covenant. Yeah. It's written yeah. in the covenant. Yeah. Wow. It is actually written in the covenant. He's going to always hold up his end. Wow. Wow. And, yeah. and that's just it. Everybody's willing to believe God for the good that he said he'll do. But when he says he'll punish, it's like, no, he's too good to do that. No, he loves me too much to do that. And at no point does it we say, mistake his mercy for his approval. His approval. And we're talking about generations past that still goes back 
to the law. It still goes back to the days of Moses. Kind of like now and today, it's kind of like it's the same thing. Everything goes back to Moses. This is this is where the covenant begins. It's like, but how do you do that when you keep saying we doing away with it? <laughs> exactly. Wow. Exactly. I'm sorry. Yeah. I that just hit me as no, at, no, 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 no. I'm like people hear about new covenant and they think that for some reason God has changed and he he's going to um overlook you know rebellion and so on and so forth. He is not. He is not. And if I'm friend covenant, <laughs> it, it ain't even no fine print. It's right there. They don't understand even the fundamentals of the gospel that it is the power of God and everything that God expects to see, he expects it to happen by his power. If you really want to understand what God's talking about when he's talking about works, when you really study it out, understand what he means, he's talking about the surrender of your will to him mm -hmm. to allow his power to do in you what you could never do by your own effort. If it is not happening in our experience, it is not happening because we are refusing to yield to God on some point. Mm -hmm. And that's what we don't understand. See, God has the power to do whatever he wants to do and see in us. If it is not happening, it's because we are resisting his will. Wow. And we are, we are yielding to Satan and his suggestion to do something that God is, will not have us to do. And I digress. I went off on that because I just made that quick connection, but you, you, no, you no, no, I this could. because uh, you were saying about uh, the parents that didn't, know what to how to educate no that they didn't do it they did do it. the covenant <laughs> okay that was a part of the covenant okay you're supposed to pass certain things down to your generations that was a yeah. part of the covenant gotcha yes so we had already read um this very thing in daniel so you see as daniel was studying jeremiah he was pointed back to Moses. Yeah. So that's why we see in Daniel nine, he says, I was studying the books of Jeremiah, but then when he starts praying, he starts talking about, let's go back there real quick. Go to Daniel chapter nine. And we're not even going to do the comparison with those verses. I just hope people can, can make the connection. Daniel chapter nine and verse 11. Mm -hmm. It says, yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore, the curse is poured upon us and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. And he hath confirmed his words, which he spake against us and against our judges and that judged us by bringing upon us a great evil. For under the whole heaven hath not been done as hath been done upon Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil has come upon us. Yet may we not our prayer before our God that we might turn from our iniquities and understand thy truth. See, this is what happened. He was studying Jeremiah and he noticed that Jeremiah pointed back to Moses, not Jehoiakim, not Manasseh, and not Hezekiah. Jeremiah points back to Moses. See, we thought we had got to the root cause of it, right? Mm -hmm. We did not get to the root cause of it. We did not. Now, I want you to notice how Daniel starts this prayer. Look at verse four. Look at verse four. And she says, and I, pr okay. Daniel nine, verse four. It says, and I prayed unto the Lord, my God, and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and that keep, and to them that keep his commandments. And you see that, right? Mm -hmm. Hold your finger there. Mm -hmm. And turn to the book of Deuteronomy. Turn to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 7. See, the same thing Daniel did is the same thing I did. I followed Daniel's example. Mm -hmm. Daniel was reading Jeremiah. Jeremiah started quoting Moses. Mm -hmm. So what is God telling you to do? He's telling you to go back and see the same principle that we just saw in the last study. Mm -hmm. He's doing the same thing, but he's not telling you you know, more information is found in the book of Moses. She says, no, this has happened because of what was written in the book of Moses, but it's the same clue. Mm -hmm. So you're studying Jeremiah. Jeremiah starts quoting Moses. You're being told to go back and study Moses. Mm -hmm. And I say, this is what Daniel did. Now, yep. remember what we just read in Daniel chapter nine, Daniel said, and I pray 
stay in Deuteronomy. Daniel said, I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. You're in Deuteronomy mm -hmm. chapter 7 and verse 9. Know therefore the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Now, do you see that? Let me look at me. me just, I'm going to read this one part from Daniel chapter 9. And then I want you to read Deuteronomy 7, 9 again. Listen closely. Keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. That's from Daniel chapter 9. Now read Deuteronomy 7, 9. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Daniel quotes Moses verbatim. Do you see that part in Deuteronomy 7 where it says keeping covenant? Mm -hmm. I'm going to read it from I'm gonna read it from Daniel. Keep your eyes on that piece mm -hmm. as I read this from Daniel. This is Daniel 9. Mm -hmm. Keeping covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. You see how most he was reading Jeremiah Jeremiah pointed to, to Moses. Daniel went back and studied Moses. And when he starts his prayer, he starts his prayer with a quote from Moses. I want you to turn to De Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28. You're going to stay there. And now we're going to compare. This is what we did in uh, the study with the, on Conf Encourage Part 2, mm -hmm. where we compared Jeremiah's writings with Moses' writings. And you can see that Jeremiah is basically quoting from the curse of Moses and what God said he would do if they broke the covenant. And this is how I discovered that. It wasn't, you know, studying for them. It was actually studying the book of Daniel. God led back to Jeremiah. Jeremiah said, you know, you need to check the writings of Moses. And then you compare the two and you start to find similar verses. Mm -hmm. Nothing but the Holy Spirit. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. All right, so you read Deuteronomy twenty eight forty eight. Therefore shall thy serve thine enemies, which the Lord shall send against thee. Oh, this is Deuteronomy? Hmm. And hunger, and in thirst, and in nakedness, and in want of all things, and he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck until he have destroyed thee. He shall put a yoke of what? Iron. All right, this was spoken by Moses, right? Mm -hmm. This is from Jeremiah 28. Stay in Deuteronomy 28. This is from Jeremiah 28, 14. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have put a yoke of iron upon the neck of all these nations that they may serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and they shall serve him. And I have given him the beast of the field also. So this is Jeremiah prophesying that a yoke of iron is going to be put on the neck of the nations by Nebuchadnezzar, including Jerusalem. Mm. Same thing Moses wrote. Now read Deuteronomy 28, 49. The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. Okay. So three things. The Lord said he shall bring a nation from afar, right? Mm -hmm. He also says, um, as swift as the eagle flieth, right? Mm -hmm. And whose tongue thou shalt not understand. This is from Jeremiah 5, 15. Lo, I will bring a nation upon you from far. O house of Israel, saith the Lord, it is a mighty nation. It is an ancient nation, a nation whose language or tongue thou knowest not, neither understandest what they say. Almost a direct quote from Deuteronomy 28, 49. Jeremiah says this in Jeremiah 4, 13. Behold, he shall come up as clouds and his chariots shall be as the whirlwind. His horses are swifter than eagles. Almost a direct quote from Deuteronomy 28, 49. So you see that what's happening to Daniel and his friends in that day was prophesied by Moses. It is not chattel, It was not talking about the slavery in North America. It happened in Daniel's day. Now let me read Deuteronomy 28, verse 50. Oh, that I was just about to ask about. I was doubt. Nah, you probably going to explain. I was just about to ask about. Okay, something. go ahead. 
a nation of fierce countenance, which shall not regard the person of the old, nor show favor to the young. All right. This is from Second Chronicles thirty six seventeen. It says, "Therefore he, God, brought upon them the king of the Chaldeans, Nebuchadnezzar, who slew their young men with the sword in the houses of their sanctuary, and had no compassion upon young man or maiden, old man or him that stood for age. He gave them all into his hand." Now that's the question I had because Daniel and his friends were spared. Was it just because those other youngsters were just heathens and rebellious? And re okay. He said, gotcha. if you read all of Jeremiah's, he said it's going to be two groups. Yeah. Those who get entreated well because they so obeyed me, uh -huh. and those who would not submit to my word. You got to understand, like, like you said, Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he began to reign, and you think he had all old men around him? No, he had some young men around him. Telling him not to listen to the old prophet. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you get your boys around you and they start boosting you up. You're the king. You ain't got to listen to nobody. Wow. And then God sends you a warning and you don't hear it. Now read verses 51 and 52. 51. <laughs> and he shall eat the fruit yeah. of thy cattle and the fruit of thy land until thou be destroyed, which also shall not leave thee either corn, wine, or oil, or the increase of uh, thy kind. Four flocks of thy sheep until he have destroyed thee. You said 52 too, right? Yeah. And he shall besiege thee in all thy gates until thy high and fence walls come down. Wherein thou trusted throughout all the land, he shall besiege thee in all thy gates throughout all thy land, which the Lord thy God hath given thee. All right. This is from Jeremiah chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. Their quiver is as an open sepulchre, they are almighty men. And they shall eat up thine harvest and thy bread, which thy sons and thy daughters should eat. They shall eat up thy flocks and thy herd. They shall eat up thy vines and thy fig trees. They shall impoverish thee, thy fenced cities. They shall impoverish thy fenced cities wherein thou trustest with the sword. Nevertheless, in those days, saith the Lord, I will not make a full end of you. So again, we, I think people get the idea yeah. that the same thing that Moses is saying Jeremiah is prophesying what's about to happen. You were warned about when the covenant was first made. When the covenant was first made. You should have read the contract and known what was what <laughs> when it was first was made. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Not just the parts that you wanted to hear. <laughs> right. And people are doing the same thing with the new covenant that Israel did with the old covenant. You're going to trust God for every blessing he said he's going to give. But when he promises to punish sin and rebellion, you say, no, not me. Once saved, always saved. Wow. You're going to take the good parts of the covenant and ignore when God says, just as faithful as I will be to bless you, if you yield your will, I will be as faithful to allow the, the punishment if you resist my will. Yeah, you want to redact that part. Right, you want to take the black magic mark and be like, all right, this don't apply, this don't apply now. Yes, yeah, and you can do that. <laughs> you can blind yourself to it. You have the free will to blind yourself to it, but trust me, he got the original copy and it is not redacted. So you can redact everything you want. You can put on blinders to everything you want. But at the end of the day, if you resist his will, because that's the only way that the fruit of the gospel does not happen in our life. The only way that happens is if we resist his will. So it's not about works. It's about denying God the the, the right to work in you to do what he wants to do. And, and look at it this way. It's kind of like when you go to court, right? Typically, a contract is with, you know, two individuals or whatever. And they both have, you know, stake and interest. In, in, and in this case, it's the same thing. But. Let's say, for instance, now you're in court and the judge is like, and I, I've seen instances of this where, you know, there's a, a, an offender and the judge is like, you know what? I want to do something I normally don't do. I'm going to grant you mercy on this. I'm not going to send you this. But here's the deal. You cannot get into any more trouble. You cannot do this. I don't want to see you in my courtroom another or else I'm going to um, push the, the penalty to the extent of the law I can. Now. When a judge is telling you this, 
Yeah. Don't you think if you go ahead and just do what you want to do, he gonna be like, listen, I'm the one who can put you wherever, and I'm telling you directly, and this is coming from me. This ain't coming from no attorney. This ain't coming from, you know, nobody else in the courtroom. This is coming directly from me. Now, it would behoove you to take heed to what this judge is saying because he has the power to do exactly what he said he's going to do in that contract or that covenant that he just made with you. Yeah. Wow. A pardon is not a license to commit crime and break the law as often as you want. Right. It is not that. It is actually a pardon is, is given when you agree to walk in a different life. Yeah. Yeah. A part of that pardon is I will not repeat. <laughs> I, I will not do the things that got me here before. And the difference is when you get a pardon from an earthly governor, he has no power to help you keep that word. When you get a pardon from Christ, he has all power to keep you from falling. He can give you the Holy Spirit, omnipotent, divine power to transform your mind and your heart and make sin distasteful to you. And that's why he can, he can judge that way because he didn't depend on you to actually give the obedience. He depended on you to surrender your will to allow him to do it in you. And so if it's not seen in you, it's not because he failed. It's because you use your free will to resist his will. Yep. And herein lies the Christianity and gospel that's being preached today. Just believe. Just believe like, like a childlike Santa Claus belief. No evidence of divine power working in our lives to change us and make sin distasteful to us to produce in us the love of God that we come to the place that we would rather die than hurt the one who loves us and we love. That is what the gospel is supposed to do as it transforms our heart. And if it's not happening, and this is just examine yourself to know that you're in the faith. If it is not happening, it is because somewhere in our, our life, we are exercising our free will to resist the will of God. I mean, he will not force your will. He will not. You must yield it. So let's go to two places real quick and bring this to a close. Okay. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 6 so we can see the instruction. And again, as Jeremiah is prophesying, Jeremiah keeps quoting Moses. So if you are a wise and obedient parent and you got kids that are coming into this world at this time, it would behoove you to go back to Moses. I'm talking about in Jeremiah's time when Daniel and them were being born. It would behoove those parents to go back and look at the instructions Moses gave and follow them. And that's how you prepare your child. So let's go to Deuteronomy 6. Mm -hmm. Starting at verse 1. Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you that you might do them in the land whither you go to pro to possess it. Keep going to verse 9. Okay. That thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I commanded thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son in all the days of thy life, and that, they, and that thy days may be prolonged. Hear therefore, O Israel, and reserve to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily as the Lord God of thy fathers had promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord of God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt buy them for a sign upon thy hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thy eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy deeds. Amen. So you see, he gives the instruction. I am giving you the words. I'm having them written out for you. And these words which I command you, verse 6, shall be in your heart. 
and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and thou shalt talk of them when you're sitting around your house. We're not doing that today. We're on social media. We're scrolling and all this other stuff. When you walk by the way, we hardly take walks anymore. <laughs> and when you lie us down, when you rise up, what is he saying? My word is supposed to govern every area of your life and every moment of your day. This is this this is the covenant. You're being restored to what was lost, meaning a connection to God. So it's like there's no time where there's a disconnect between the, you and I. Mm -hmm. All day long, every day is the actual covenant, not just one day a week. You know what I'm saying? Not just when you gather to go to church, yep. you, you put on your best or whatever. You know, people don't even do that anymore. But you just go in to worship yep. on that day. No. Every area of your life. And then you see verse 8, right? Yep. You shall bind them upon thine hand. Uh-oh. Yep. Revelation, right? <laughs> and they shall be as frontless between thine eyes. But you think it's a barcode. No, it's something that's going to replace the teachings of God. And revelation is no different. It's the mark of the beast. Mm -hmm. And basically it's the teachings of the beast. Mm -hmm. And the beast received his power from Satan. Paul says it this way. Now the spirit speaketh expressly that in the last days, some shall depart from the faith, um, giving heed to seducing spirits and the doctrines of devils. Doctrine means teaching. So when it talks about it being in your forehead and your hand, is somehow talking about the teachings of Satan. Yeah, as there shall be frontless between thine eyes. What's between your eyes? <laughs> or <Forehead>. that. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. <laughs> so the it's talking about where you make your decisions, your forehead, your hands is how you do all your work. So God is basically saying, My word is supposed to govern what you think and the decisions you make, and it's also supposed to govern your hands, everything that you do. And you're supposed to teach this to your children by precept, by teaching it verbally, and by your example as they watch you. Yeah. Your whole house, as the wow. post upon your door, your whole house is supposed to be governed. Not literally, not visibly written up here. It's supposed to govern here. It's supposed to govern what these do. It governs how you run your house. So so real quick, people close on this last point. It's on the post of your house. That means when people walk by the post of your house, they should know the people that live there, you know, they, they something different. <laughs> yes, yeah, but it wasn't supposed to be literal. He's not talking about a literal sign. He's talking about this governs your house. Yep. They should be. He doesn't want them to just see how, see how your family is conducted. Yes. Mm -hmm. A well-ordered family, the respect between the two, the respect of the children, the, 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 the happiness and peace of the family it's supposed to be a testimony. Your house is supposed to be a not the physical house. Right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. People that make up the house. Right. Yeah, I was just referencing the so door. We, Usually is what people see to a house, but... Yeah, exactly. But, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So we're going to read a couple of scriptures from our first study. And we're going to bring out... We're going to zoom in on something that we didn't touch upon last study. That connects to this study. All right, so let's go to 2 Kings 18. 2 Kings 18. 2 Kings 18. You know, in the first study, we were basically talking about, like, um, the fathers, right? Joachim and Hezekiah, Manasseh, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. But... What did I say? Second Kings 18, right? Mm -hmm. Three verses, three verses one and two. Now it came to pass in the third year of Hoshea, son of Eli, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, I don't know if I'm saying that right, king of Judah, Ahaz, and Ahaz king of Judah began to reign. Twenty and five years ago, twenty and five years old, was when he began to reign, and he reigned twenty and nine years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was also 
Abi, the daughter of Zechariah. All right, so let's go to 2 Kings 21. Let me see if you can see a pattern here. 2 Kings 21. These are the same three kings we studied in part one. Okay. Of Daniel. 2 Kings 21 and verse 1 says, Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Hetzabah. Turn over to 2 Kings 23 and verse 36. Mm-hmm. 2 Kings 23 and verse 36. It says Jehoiakim was 20 and 5 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Zebuda. What did you just see? It's a detail that's given about all three of these. I mean, their mothers, the mother's name. Thank you. Yeah. You, again, as a screenwriter, are you putting in information because you need to fill space? Or are you trying to send a clue to people who gather up scripture and compare them? Why do you think their mother is being named? Um, because they're speaking to where they would have got their life lessons from or what type of Thank you. character did they come from? And it's there is no influence on earth that is stronger than the mother. The father may have authority, this, that, and the other. Mama got your influence. Mama got your love. If mama needs it, mama gonna get it. In most cases, if it come down to saving father or mother, sorry, pop. <laughs> <laughs> if you can't say, but I got to, you know, <laughs> I'm doing you a favor by letting you die and saving her. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> so God is showing you the strength and power and influence of the mother upon the child. If that child does right, the mother has something to do with it. If that child does evil, the mother had a big part to play. Not that the father doesn't have anything to do with it. It's not what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying? But God is telling you who the mother is because he's trying to get you to see that what you read after this is the fruit of that mother's influence. And in some cases, it actually says their mother, the daughter of such and such. So that means generationally, you know, yeah, passed down. Again, pay attention to the information because the little details are many times are giving you life lessons. If you pay attention. The mother's influence is super strong. And that's why Mary was chosen. You see her faith? The angel comes and tells her she gonna get pregnant and without sleeping with a man. All he says is the power of God is gonna come upon you and with God, nothing shall be impossible. Be, be that, you know, according to your word. You see that faith? Mm. That's who was chosen as the mother of the Messiah. But here's a troublemaker question. If we're supposed to be under the divine order that God has and man is the how to hit the household, shouldn't the mother's influence come from the man first? <laughs> it should. Okay. It should. And in, in the divine order, it would. Okay. He would receive from God. He disseminates to the wife and the wife disseminates it to the children. Okay. And even on the physical level, that's how God had it. The man was supposed to be the provider, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. He goes out, he works, he gets the food, right? Yeah. And how does a newborn baby get his? Through the mother. Directly from her, right? Right. Even in the physical world, it's the same thing. So yeah, he's supposed to be head of the household, God teaching him, giving him the spiritual lessons. And she's supposed to be able to break that thing down to feed it to the children. She can, see, You can bring in all the stuff for the household, right? But you you can't you can't make it for the newborn baby. You don't have the ability because he can't eat that that stuff that you bring in. Right. She has to eat it, digest it, and simplify it for him to be able to take the milk. Oh. And that's the same thing with the word of God. She takes what the husband gets from God, and she breaks it down, and she disseminates it 
in a simpler form for the children. Wow. And in those cases, the, the father or the man of the house is not walking with God. She still can walk under God's authority. <laughs> she has to. <laughs> can submit herself. I mean, she's supposed to submit herself to her husband as far as, you know, is not bringing her out of harmony with God. Right. Right. She has to go to God. God is first. He is authority over all. And what we see in the world right now is because men have rebelled against the authority of God. Women don't have to obey their authority. So they're actually taking positions of authority. You can't you can't claim headship and authority if you're not giving the example of submitting to the authority over you. See, the woman is supposed to when you lead, we have authority. You lead by example, not by strength and power. So the example that men are setting is I don't have to submit to the authority that's over me. And so when she rebels, she's actually obeying your authority because that's the lesson you taught her. Hey. <laughs> Ooh. That's the lesson you taught. That was deep. You know, so we got to close it here. Yeah. But but basically, again, when you go to Daniel chapter one, it, it was studying with parents that sent me down this rabbit hole and starting to look at, you know, what, what was it like for their parents? And then discovering that Jeremiah's prophetic ministry was happening even before Daniel was born. Probably about 10, 10 years or more, a decade or more than when Daniel was born. So his parents had time to consider what the Lord was saying. They had time to consider, you know, what Jeremiah was telling them about the law of Moses and going back to study the law of Moses and to raise their children according to the instructions that were given to Moses to prepare them for this prophecy that Babylon was going to rise to power and it was going to do these things. And it may seem like it's ancient history, but Revelation tells us that a new worldwide Babylon is rising to power and your children are not going to be unaffected. And we don't know at what time through either tragedy or some law being passed that your children can be taken from you. And trust me, parents are going through this already, especially with that transgender thing. If they try to stand against, you know, supporting that movement. Before so we God is trying to teach us how to navigate this thing. Just as a parent, before we even get there, I mean, just the, the structures and systems that are put in place. And I think I mentioned this before. You know, when you go to schools and doctors, they want to block the parents out. They feel like, oh, the child has their their privacy at, you know, and I'm like, really? <laughs> they can. That, that's a part. That's a part of the manifestation of the end time rise of Babylon. Mm. See, just because they don't take they don't come in with troops like Nebuchadnezzar did and forcibly take your children. They're trying to do it through those mechanisms. It's not going to look the exact same. And that's why I said it's not future. We're already in the midst of the rise of Babylon. They already have taken captive many children. Yeah. You got to realize that this is spiritual warfare and Satan learns from the mistakes of the past and war. And he's just like, oh, let me try it this way. They won't see this coming. So you got to understand how all of that works. Yeah. And great study today. Stay great study today, cousin. This one, this one's deep. Um, hopefully you guys have taken uh, some, some great lessons from here and you will probably go back and, and review and, and, and go through this study in, in the first study and it hopefully it will inspire you to continue down the rabbit hole um, so to speak and, and look and search the scriptures for, for, for other truths um, I would say if you have any other questions or maybe uh, things that you weren't sure about or maybe want us to dive into or maybe you know decode so to speak uh drop them in the comments you know are, are you you know enjoying these um studies as we dive through are you learning something we'd like to hear from you so as always we ask that you would continue to hit the like button hit the follow button share button uh the subscribe button let us um help us to continue to grow the kingdom and really get the word and the truth out 
for people that really want to hear and, and get the truth from God. So on that note, um, thank you. And we'll see you next week. God bless. Amen.